turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at a well-known story about the healing of the official son. Um, It's going to be up on the screen as well. But I'm going to be reading from verse 46 to 54. And tonight I'll be reading from the English Standard Version in John's Gospel. So John chapter 4. And so we read from verse 46. So he came again to Cana into Galilee, where he made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was, was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. So Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he, and he himself believed and all his household. This is now the second sign that Jesus did when he'd come from Judea into Galilee. Let's pray. Gracious God, we know that your word is indeed living and active. We know that it's powerful, Lord Jesus, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. So, Lord, I ask that we really understand the truths of this this account. This isn't a fable or a a fairy tale, but this is a genuine miracle. So, Holy Spirit, I ask, be with me now as I'm preaching. Help those listening to really understand and to hear what you need them to hear. We pray all this through Jesus' name. Amen. So, just before Christmas, I was at Willow Shopping Centre and I saw that I could get a haircut for 10 bucks. And I was like, great, I'll get a $10 haircut. And I wasn't the only wise fellow there because there were about 10 other blokes there also all waiting for a $10 haircut. And as I was there, I was lining up and I was talking to the guy that was doing it. Um, and he was an Egyptian fellow. Turns out that he was an Egyptian Christian or a cryptic Christian. The, the part of the church that gets heavily persecuted. And I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a Baptist pastor. And we had a good old time. And as I was talking with him, um, he was telling me a bit about his faith and what he does. And he says he's got a shop here and a shop, I think, over at Castletown. And it was good. And I started to get my hair cut. And remember, this was a $10 haircut. I thought, okay, this is going to be good. We'll see how we go. And as you can imagine, as I'm getting my hair cut, I have to take my glasses off. Now, when I take off my glasses, I'm as blind as a Charter's Towers bat. Like, I, I can't see a thing. I can't see probably three metres in front of me. So as this guy was going along, he was talking. I'm thinking, I hope, I hope he knows what he's doing. He was very confident. And that was all well and good until he started hacking into my eyebrows. Now... I don't know what's wrong with my eyebrows. I know they can get a bit bushy. You know, John Howard may be proud of how they can be, but he was so confident. He went quick as a flash from here to here with, with a comb and with a zero blade and just zoom, zoom. All I could think is, what's he doing? I had to put my faith in this bloke. I couldn't see what he was doing. All I could see is this blob moving in front of me in the mirror going through my eyebrows. And I thought, no, I'm a man of faith. I've got to believe. So I put my trust in this Egyptian man, and lo and behold, it did all right. Melinda didn't even notice, so it must have, been, must have been good. But I was thinking about this, and the reality is we all put faith in something. Even if you're not a believer, people put their faith in stuff. They put their faith in their job or their families or whatever, and it's not uncommon to put your faith in different things. But we, of course, as followers of Jesus, we're called to put our faith in Jesus himself. And so this is why I love this story, because it's about a man who had faith. It's about a man who heard what Jesus had done, and he had long-distance faith, because it was a long distance between the two places, as we'll see in a moment. And it's a reminder to us tonight that we can have faith too in Jesus, because of what he's done, and because we know what he's going to do when he returns. So let's have a look at this. Let me dive into the text. We read in verse 46 that Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee, where he made water into wine. If you read John chapter 4, the most part of that first part of John chapter 4 is all about the Samaritan woman and the fact that he went to the woman at the well and through that meeting with the woman in the well in Samaria, everyone believed. Jesus knew who she was. He, He went deliberately at a time when only she would be there 
He spoke into her life. He called her out on her sin and she became a follower. She went home and told everyone in the town and they became followers as well. And so this is on the back of that. He's coming back into Galilee. And as this is occurring, he's coming back into a place that was familiar, a place where he performed his first public miracle, turning water into wine at the, at the wedding feast, as, as you know that story well. So this is Jesus back here. And as we think about this, we know that word gets around. They didn't have Facebook or Twitter, but as we know, the grapevine, the gossip vine, word gets around. People started to hear about Jesus, who he was and what he'd done. They may have heard about one miracle or another miracle, but they knew that, hey, this Jesus fellow, he was worth listening to. And that's where this official comes in. When we have a look at the second part in verse 46, there was an official who was in Capernaum. That's all we know about him. He was an official. He was an important fellow. We don't know if he was a Jew or a Gentile. Some think that he was a Jew that worked for Herod. Others say, no, no, he was a, a, a Gentile. It doesn't matter. The point is he was a man with a problem. And what was his problem? His son was ill. His son was ill. And this is what we read. So this is kind of the scenario. And then we read in verse 47, it says, When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and he asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. He'd heard about Jesus. He knew, hey, Jesus is in my area. This healer, I've got to go see him. My son is dying. He knew that Jesus had done miracles and he thought, I need to go to him. He's the only one that can help me. So he did that. He went to see Jesus. As I was reading this, I was reading through a commentary and it gave a very good summary about this man's faith, about how this official's faith changed phases. I'm actually going to use these phrases. I'm going to stand on the shoulders of giants, as it were. This commentator says that initially this official he had a crisis faith. There was something going on. There was a crisis happening in this man's life. He was about to lose his son. And so he knew the only thing he could do was go to Jesus. So his faith started off at a crisis point. And then so he went to Jesus. How easy is it for us to think those three words? He went to Jesus. Well, that's easy. He just walked down the road. He jumped in his car. But it was a long distance away. We can see... If you can click on the next slide for me, we'll see there's a map between the two different places. You can see Capernaum above the Sea of Galilee and then Cana. It's 20 to 25 miles, or if you're like me, you don't understand what a mile is, it's 32 to 40 kilometres. This wasn't an air-conditioned car. This bloke had to go there probably by walking or on the back of a horse or a donkey or something. The point is he must have believed that Jesus could have done it because he made that long trip to go and see Jesus. And he made that journey. And then he asked Jesus, he said, look, Jesus, my son is sick. Come back. Help me. Come back with me because my son is about to die. So what did Jesus say? You know, Jesus, it's always nice. Jesus, gentle, mild, meek Jesus. What did he say? Yeah, come on, let's go. Saddle the donkey. I'll come with you. He said something which on the surface seems really mean and very blunt. Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That doesn't seem very loving of Jesus, does it? He's saying, look, this guy has come and he's desperate. And Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The, glo the, the guy clearly believed because he just traveled 40 kilometers to come to Jesus to say, come back with me. But Jesus was referring to the sort of faith that trusts in signs and wonders. We know Jesus did many signs and many wonders, but those signs and wonders were proving who he was. So when he said things such as, I will die and I will rise again, you could believe that. Different commentators believe that Jesus was not just referring to this guy, but the current generation. That there's an idea of faith that relies on only seeing a miracle. You might have met these people. They say boldly, I'll only believe in God when I see evidence of him in front of me. Have you met people like that? And that's when you say, mate, look at the mountains, look at nature, look at creation. It's right in front of you. But Jesus is saying, look, unless you believe, in, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. And it's an echo to what he says in Matthew 12, when the Pharisees were questioning him and he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. So Jesus is talking about faith. And he's wanting to, and we know from the Bible, he wants people to believe his word and trust in his word. 
Yes, the signs are good, but they point to what he's saying as well. So back to the official. We think about this poor guy. Just imagine what it was like. He travelled all this way. His son was dying. He thought, right, Jesus is going to come and help me out. It'll be right. And effectively, Jesus said, no, I'm not coming. Imagine the disappointment on the official. So what did he do? The official again appealed to the mercy of Jesus. He he said, sir, come down before my child dies. He asked him again, look, I need you to come. My child's about to die. He didn't get into a theological debate. He just said, look, I need you, Jesus. My son is about to die. He knew that only Jesus could save his son, and he was appealing to that. But what he did, though, in saying, come to me, he assumed that Jesus had to be in the presence of his son. I love when you read the Bible because you see different things that Jesus did. Sometimes he touched someone and he healed them. Other times he spoke and they were healed. In this case, he said it and 40 kilometers down the road, it happened. So we see the absolute power of Jesus. But this man assumed Jesus had to be there. So Jesus, having his mercy appealed to, what did he say in verse 50? He gives a command and then he gives a promise. He says, go. Go where? Go home. Go, your son will live. He doesn't say, I'm going to come with you. He says, look, I don't need to come, but you go and your son will live. So that's a promise, a command, sorry, and then a promise. So then what did the official do? Did he say, come on, no, I need you there. He must have believed him because in in the rest of verse 50, it says the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went on his way. The bloke didn't go to Macca's, he went home to his son. He believed that Jesus was doing what he said he would do, and then he went to his son. I envy this man's faith, don't you? He travelled all this way based on what Jesus has said, and then Jesus said, look, go home, your son will be fine, and he travelled back, and he believed. Think about it. It's hard for me to think about it. I still remember my original Nokia 5110 when I think about mobile phones, but even back then, there were no mobile phones. He couldn't call his son and say, son, it's going to be okay. He had to travel back thinking about what did Jesus actually say. So going back to this summary of faith, remember the man had a, had a crisis of faith, and then now in this phase, after Jesus gave him the command and the promise, he turned to a confident faith. He wasn't confident in himself, but he was confident in what Jesus had said. And he believed him, as we see there. He went from a crisis of faith to confidence faith. And he believed that the word of Jesus was true, and he believed it enough to go. And thankfully, we keep reading the story in verse 51. As he was going down, you can imagine him approaching his house, his servants came to him. And they told him, look, mate, your son's okay. Told him that his son was recovering. He gave them the news that he was desperate to hear. And he said, your son, they said, sorry, your son is getting better. How good is that? And then he asked a logical question in verse 52. He asked them, When did he get better? What was the hour when he became to be better? And they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So obviously, the man delayed his his journey, or it took him a long time, because yesterday was when he was talking to Jesus. And this is the new day. His faith was um, confirmed in what Jesus had said. But Jesus said, go, your son will live, and lo and behold, the son lived. And we read in verse 53, that the moment the son got better was the exact moment Jesus said, your son will live. Verse 53, the father knew that the hour, that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So the very moment Jesus said it, it came true. Even 40 kilometers away, Jesus was able to speak it and it came true. That moment the boy was healed. This is a long distance miracle requiring of the man long-distance faith. The faith that knows that to trust in Jesus. They were separated by many kilometres, and yet this man knew he could believe Jesus. And he got home and the son was healed. And then the story doesn't stop there. Have a look at this next part in verse 53. Because it says again, and he believed. The official believed. What did he believe? He already knew that Jesus was going to heal his son, that's why he left. He already knew that Jesus was some sort of healer, which is why he initially went there. But John tells us that he believed after seeing that his son was healed, after hearing the promise of God and then seeing it happen. He believed. So what did the man believe? 
all that Jesus had claimed, that he was the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, the only one who could come to save the world. So this, man faith, this man's faith sorry, changes, as a commentator says. It went from a confident faith to a confirmed faith. He'd seen a miracle happen and he's gone, yes. He believed Jesus enough to go and then he'd seen it happen and he believed in everything about Jesus. He wasn't just a prophet. He was God. He knew that he was Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. And he believed in that. He had a confirmed faith. He was confirming exactly who he was. But then the story continues. The next little step in verse 53. What happened after that? And all his household. What did they do? They believed. So this man saw the miracle, saw it come to fruition. He believed in Jesus and so did all his household. Isn't that amazing? This faith went from, what do we say? Let me check my notes. It went from a confident faith to a contagious faith. During a pandemic, contagious isn't a good word, is it? But we want to have a contagious faith because this man had a contagious faith because he believed. And you know what he would have done? He would have told people, that was the hour when Jesus said, my son was healed and he was healed. How else would his household would have believed? All of his house believed that Jesus was Christ, not because of this man's faith, but because of his testimony. This is what Jesus said he would do, and this is what he's done. So because of that man's contagious faith, his whole household believed. So we know that he told others. And we read about stories and accounts of this in the Bible. We know that people share their faith, and through that, people believe. And just in case you doubt the validity of this, if we read in verse 54... The Apostle John says this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he'd come from Judea to Galilee. This was not the second miracle the, the Lord did in his time ministry up to this point, but the second major sign in this area. So you're thinking to yourself, well, that's fantastic, but why do I care? Why should it matter? Well, firstly, it's a reminder that Jesus is way more powerful than, than we often think. We forget that he's not just a prophet, but he is God. We can be like that man who often limits or thinks that Jesus can only do certain things. Remember the man, he said, you've got to come to me to my house and you've got to see the boy. He probably thought he had to put his hand on the boy in order to heal him. No, Jesus is way more powerful. He spoke, buzz, and the man, the boy was healed. We read stories like this and what does it do? It encourages our own faith. It reminds us that God can do anything. God can do exceedingly abundantly above anything we even think, ask or dream. That's the God that we serve. Isn't that amazing? That's what we need to be encouraged by. That's the mighty God. And if we think about this, um, one other commentator said it also ought to spur us on in our prayer. That we have a mighty God who hears our requests and who's able to work out his purposes in any part of the world at any time. Tonight, I pray for people I've never met. I pray for people in Ukraine. I don't know any Ukrainians, but God does. It's not 40 kilometres, it's a lot longer distance between here and Ukraine than it was from Capernaum to, to Cana. But the idea is we pray and we trust and we know that God can do anything. So we need to get to our knees in prayer. We think about this image, and, and this is a posture, this isn't an actual thing. Mind you, some of you love to sit on your knees literally and pray, and all the power to you. But it's a posture of saying, God, I need your help. God, I can't do this. God, but you can do this. You are all powerful. Secondly, we read this account and we're reminded of something good. Later on in the Gospel of John, John sums up the reason why the Gospels were written. We read in John chapter 20, verse 30. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we read this, and the call is to be like that official. If you're a follower of Christ, and you started with the crisis of faith, because you realize, I can't clean myself. No manner of good works will outdo all my own sin. I can't ever make myself good before God. You come to Jesus knowing that only he can save. And then we confess our sins. We believe that Jesus is enough. We become born again and our lives start to change. Our works demonstrate a faith that saves us. 
We walk around confident then, like that man was, knowing that no matter what happens, no matter what's going on in the world, Jesus is still God. And nothing can separate us from his love. And the more we walk, God answers prayer. We're talking about this this morning. It's amazing the prayer God answers. From the big ones about healing to the little ones about, God, help me find a parking spot at the Woolies Arcade. It's really busy today. So we go from that, where it's the attitude of a confident faith. And we can be like this official, knowing that God is good and then being encouraged by that. Once we, ref- we think about and reflect on all that God has done, our faith is confirmed. We're reminded that we can't trust ourselves, but we can trust Jesus. We're reminded about all the wonderful things God has done, and our faith is confirmed, that we have placed our faith in the one true God. But then we've got to go a step further. We've got, not got to stop there at this idea of confirmed faith. It's got to be contagious faith. We've got to go tell others about Jesus. We've got to be like John Newton who said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. He's telling others, hey, I was this and now I'm not. Your testimony is amazing. What, as you proclaim and tell people, this is what Jesus has done, it's amazing. Because we know that we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but we're alive in Christ. So we need to have a contagious faith that goes and tells other people because it's great in here and we love it in here, but there's, what, 10,000 odd people out there that don't know this, that are trusting in self or they're trusting in something else, anything apart from Jesus. So others aren't saved because of our faith, but others hear the testimony and they hear what God has done and we point them to the one who can save. And that's what we ought to be doing. In a moment after this, we're going to sing the song, Go Forth. Go forth in his name and proclaiming Jesus reigns. There's a line which stood out to me and talks about the world. It says, countless the souls that are stumbling in darkness. Why do we, the church, sleep in the night? Jesus commands us to go make disciples. This is our cause. This is our fight. So what are we to do? We are to go forth in his name, proclaiming Jesus reigns. Now is the time for the church to arise and proclaim him Jesus, Saviour, Redeemer and Lord. Let's be like this official. Let's go with contagious faith. Go proclaiming that Jesus is Saviour, Redeemer and Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we have seen tonight that you are indeed all-powerful. Lord Jesus, we know that you did many other things during your time on earth, but the things that are written down in the Gospels are done so that we may believe. And believing in you, we, we may have life in your name. And for those of us here that have that assurance of faith, that blessed assurance, God, that is a good thing, but give us then the desire to go and tell others. Give us the boldness when we're scared. Help us to be contagious in our faith. Not saying, gee, look what I've done, but saying, look what Jesus has done in my life. And look what Jesus will do. Help us, Lord, to be like this man who proclaimed and it's tested to your great works. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the witnesses. We thank you for the faithful people throughout the years. Help us to be faithful to what we know you've called us to do. Give us the ability to go forth in your name this week and proclaiming that you are Jesus and you reign. And we say this in your precious name. Amen.